Hello, and welcome to Aberon's Armorial. Don't worry, before I start this video, not all of my videos are going to be narrated slideshows. I know they can be tiring, but for things like this, it works really well. So I'm going to start with these for a couple of days while I have some free time. It's currently my spring break, so I'm going to use it to make a couple of these that I feel would be informative and nice. This is going to be part one of a three-part, possibly four-part series explaining the evolution of the Royal Arms. So we're going to start today with part one, England. Now, as many of you may know, heraldry really did not get its start until the 11 and 1200s, possibly even later, depending on where you want to put the start date. There, it's kind of a fluid date. But two things that are going to come up and serve as a bedrock for the heraldic foundation of the kings of England are going to be these, attributed arms. Now, the first one on the left is, of course, the Banner of Wessex, which is a wyvern or a dragon, depending on how you want to call it. I would personally say it's a wyvern. I think most people would agree. But it, the important part here is that it's ore and ghouls, which will be the livery colors of England forever and still are attributed to that, pardon me. And of course, the arms on the right, which are the attributed arms to St. Edward the Confessor, these will pop up occasionally, less so in the royal arms. It only will happen in a couple of times. However, they will be quite common in the heraldic banners, and I will be making a video shortly in the next week or two discussing some of the banners at the Battle of Agincourt and St. Edward's banner, and there was a standard for St. Edward there, and it's kind of a romanticized thing that is carried commonly in medieval England. So these two, the ar attributed arms of Wessex and the attributed arms of St. Edward the Confessor, who is the last Wessex King of England. So the earliest designs are where we start seeing the golden lions and red field. The arms on the left were attributed to Duke William of Normandy, William the Bastard, who would become William the First when he conquered England in 1066. Um, it's debated whether or not um, his son used the same one. I've seen, ten, I've seen William Rufus's attributed arms as both the two lions and the single lion rampant. Um, there's a brief interlude in the middle of the um, Norman house and up through the house of Anjou, which will show the single lion or the lions fighting together. That's only for one year in 1189. And then the final arms, which are most commonly attributed to the Plantagenets, but are common in the House of Anjou as well, as well, are the three lions on a gold field. This will remain the arms of England forever at this point. So from 1189 is when we finally get the final design. So these will stay in progress from Richard I all the way up until Richard III. But as you can see, this is a very simple achievement. Again, all of these are coming from Sodkin assets, which I like because they're very clear and concise. He has them all laid out and clearly labeled. So for an educational purpose, it helps greatly. So of course, this is the Royal Arms of England. It's still present on the Royal Arms of the United Kingdom, but there are some differences. Of course, it's the three, the shield is unchanged. However, the crest shows the lion crowned instead of the lion standing on the crown. The lion is standing on a cap of maintenance, a chapeau, whatever you want to call it, and the um, liveries are still ermine and red velvet. And notice the helm is also just an esquire's helm. Early heraldry really didn't depict the different things, but it makes sense for this. So these arms will stay common through Richard I, King John, Henry III, Edward I, II, and III. And with Edward III, the arms finally change to these which of course now quarter the lilies of France. This is also about the same time that you start seeing the garter buckle for the order of the garter, which bears the motto, en sequi malipense, which means evil on him, or something on him who thinks evil of it. I'm sorry, I had a brain fart today. But these will be the arms of Edward III from 1377, or 1337 to 1377, and then later, his distant relative, Henry IV, from 1399 until 1413. The reason why these are quartered is because in 1337, 
Edward III lays claim to the vacant French throne, which is also being claimed by the King of France, and this starts the Hundred Years' War. And this will be something that is left in the arms all the way until Queen Victoria's time, actually. And it is still in the type, and it was still in the style until Victoria's time, where an or a crown uh, or a monarch would be crowned King of England, France, Ireland, later Scotland, that sort of thing. So from now on, you'll see either the lilies as a semi or the lilies in three. So this will be the the arms of Edward the Third and Henry the Fourth. Richard II, however, who was Edward's grandson, the son of the Black Prince, that is, because the Black Prince, who would have been Edward IV, died before his father. Richard II, between the years of 1377 and 1399, um, probably is the first king to introduce supporters to the arms. Uh, either as a badge, this might be something attributed by later heralds, however, he, uh, Sadkin draws them that way, so I'm going to use them because it's nice. Um, there are a lot of these arms that just change supporters. The shield stays the same, but the supporters change. However, the important thing about Richard II, like I said at the beginning of this, is he actually marshals his arms, so the royal arms of Quarterly of France and England, with the arms of St. Edward the Confessor. I don't know offhand why that was. However, it was a personal flair again. he's Edward the Confessor was kind of the romanticized king to be like this is before king arthur well king arthur stories are starting to come out at this time so before you look up to king arthur you look at alfred and edward the confessor you know saint kings so like i said so after you go from richard the second you go back to henry the fourth who will use the same arms as edward the third now we come to the time of the roars of the roses so this is going to be the houses of lancaster york and tudor now, each one of these will change heavily. The main thing is the shield does not change. However, you start seeing extra adamants. Mainly, the supporters will change. On the far left is actually the arms of Henry V, my favorite king, by the way, in case anybody wanted to know, <laughs> who used a lion as an, and an antelope as his supporters. The next one, who is a Yorkist king, would be Richard III, showing his two boars. And as you noticed, a crown is added around the chapeau in an interesting style. This is probably because regalia is starting to get a little more organized, as is the heraldry. And also, if you notice on the compartments, the, the Lancaster kings always had red roses. The Yorkist kings will have their white roses, and the Tudors will have their Tudor roses. When the practice of putting badges on compartments started, I do not know. However, it's something that's done nowadays, and it makes a nice illustration. Of course, the one on the last, the last arms on this page are that of Henry VII, who is the father of Henry VIII, as you may have guessed. And after he killed Richard, he became king. So this is where we start getting a pretty much standard coat of arms. The arms from Henry VIII until Queen Anne really do not change that much. So from here on out, it's going to be pretty basic. There are going to be some major changes, but the general feel of this arms is very much like the modern arms. So from 1509 to 1547, when Henry was king, these were the arms. Then Elizabeth, his daughter, and I am glossing, you may notice I am glossing over um, Edward VI and Mary, just because they had extra adamants of the arms. You know, Edward would have used his father's arms. Mary used her arms and paled with Philip of France, but her arms were just Henry's arms. Elizabeth, again, used that. The important thing to notice about these arms, however, is that the royal helm is starting to make an appearance. Also, you notice there is a tincture violation of gold and ermine. Well, not really a tincture violation because it's a fur and a metal, but it's different. It's deviated from the standard red and ermine that's even used today. So Elizabeth's arms, which are till 1603, but really, if you think about it, these arms haven't changed in 200 years at this point, which is kind of nice. So we have another hundred year gap. You know, it's not as turbulent of a time. Well, I shouldn't say that. This is the House of Stuart. But from 1603 to 1701, the arms start changing. And you will notice there's more added here. There's a lot more going on with the shield. And this shield will stay fairly 
concise for most of the uh, most of this century, excluding, of course, the interregnum during the Commonwealth, which I'm not going to talk about because that's a whole other topic that I don't want to get into today. But you will notice the arms of England are going to be in the first and fourth quarters, the arms of Scotland in the second, and the arms of Ireland in the third. At this point, for those of you who do not know, the House of Stuart was actually the reigning House of Scotland and was offered the throne after Elizabeth's death. So James the or so James the sec, is the sixth of Scotland became James the first of England. So he began quartering his arms in England with that of Scotland, and this practice still survives today. So in Scotland, the arms had different supporters, and the shield was actually flipped. So the Scottish arms took the precedence of the first and fourth quarters, while the English arms took second, and this continues to this day. You also will notice that the royal arms of Ireland are added because the title of Lord of Ireland is actually being added now as a style. It's an afterthought. It's not like of England and Ireland, it's Lord of Ireland as a separate title, which had begun in Henry VIII's time, might have been in Henry VII's even. However, the arms of Ireland are starting to be shown on here, and that's more of a solidified claim at this point. You'll notice also that the supporters from here on out do not change. The crest really does not change. The helm does not change. The compartment might change a little, but again, that's stylistic. It's really just the shield that's going to change with the ruling houses. So from 1603 to 1701, these will be the arms of James I, Charles I, Charles II, James II, and Anne, briefly Mary, but that's another thing I'm going to cover in a second. William and Mary, who were given the throne after the Glorious Revolution, had some different variations on the arms. On the left-hand side, you see them ruling jointly as William and Mary. So if you look at the arms, which look very complicated, they are just marshaled arms. The left-hand side being, of course, William, and the right-hand side being Mary. Mary's arms is no different than the last arms that we just showed, the regular Stuart arms. However, because William was offered the throne of England, he took his own arms and just placed them in a Suchian over. That will be common later in the House of Hanover when we talk about the Kingdom of Great Britain's arms. Yes, that's a separate kingdom. We're going to talk about that. So the arms of William and Mary. So that would have been while they ruled jointly from 1689 until Mary's death in 1694. And then from 1694 to 1702, William displayed his arms alone. You do not often see William's arms displayed alone only because, you know, short time, only a few years. And mainly, I think that there was a memory showing Mary there, especially as William and Mary died childless. And on top of that, Mary was the English one. So it just kind of made sense to display her arms as well. Then from William's death in 1702, these will be the arms borne by Anne until 1707. Of course, this will be the first arms of the Kingdom of Great Britain, which would be solidified in the Acts of Union in 1707 by Queen Anne. So that merged the crowns of Scotland and of England into one, creating a new kingdom called Great Britain. Now, I'm going to not discuss the Kingdom of Great Britain next. I'm going to be taking a step back into Scotland. So look in the next couple of days for a video on the evolution of the Scottish arms. It's not as complicated as the English ones. So it'll be a short video. Then we'll be able to do a video segment on the arms of the Kingdom of Great Britain. And then of course, the arms of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and Northern Ireland as it would go. So here, that's all for me today. Please remember to like and subscribe. If there's a video idea that you have, feel free to comment and reach out to me. Thank you.